So this talk is going to largely be about how we ended up with the C, Python, Stacks, and Debian that we have, and a bit of the history of how we got there. I think that history explains a lot about why things are the way they are, why we ended up with so many different ways of doing things, and why everyone's so scared of this. Um, hopefully, there's a nice, rosy future, and there is one w right way to do things now, but we'll see. So, I've been involved in the oh, Python packages and Debian for three or four years, something like that. Um, I currently maintain the PyPy package, which thankfully not many people use yet. And we're trying to start to bring up a stack of PyPy module and app packages, but there's a lot of work to, go, to do there. Um, I'm reasonably involved in the Debian Python module and app packaging teams, but I'm happy to help anyone who's got any issues with anything Python related in Debian. I can help show you around and work out what needs to be done to solve your problems. Um, for the day, my day job, I'm employed by Yola as a DevOps engineer or whatever you want to call that. I fix things and make things run. Um, so, who here uses Debian on Python? Raise a hand. Well, use Python and Debian, should I say. Ubuntu also counts because it's pretty much the same thing. It, thank you. So, lots of you. Good. Um, the Python package, C Python package in Debian is actually maintained by a guy who works for Canonical. So sometimes things happen in Ubuntu a bit first, but in general things are very similar between Debian and Ubuntu with everything Python related. Um, so for many Python developers, the question is why are we bothering with Debian operating system packages? What's the point of them? Um, for your desktop, there's a lot of point. Free software is written by a whole bunch of different groups who do things totally differently. And it's really convenient to be able to install things with just one command. You all know this if you use Debian. Um, some of the build systems are absolutely insane. No two packages build exactly the same way. Things depend on each other. Um, and we try and build a coherent operating system that obeys the file, file system hierarchy um, standard. So all Python modules live in one place, all binaries live in user bin. Everything fits together and works coherently together. Um, part of this is in handling transitions because when you change a library, everything that uses that library needs to work with a new version. And if it doesn't yet, someone's got to write a whole pile of patches to make, make that happen. Um, as a user of Debian, you don't need to worry about things like that because the thing we ship has everything just working. But that often means that you're ending up with much older versions of libraries because no one's done the work to transition them yet. Um, a bit of an overview of Debian. Debian is very maintainer-centric. Every package in Debian has a set of maintainers that look after it, and they, this package is their fiefdom. They have full control over what happens in it, how things are done, what patches are applied, what bugs are irrelevant, everything. Um, this is really something that only happens in Debian. You don't see it in Ubuntu. But these people who maintain the packages aren't necessarily Debian developers. You don't have to have blessing from the Debian project you don't have to have been around for long enough to have upload rights to maintain a package. If there's something that you find would be interested, if you'd be interested in having in Debian, you can just come and do it and have a Debian developer sponsor your work for you. Once you've been doing this for long enough, people get tired of sponsoring you and say you should really should become a Debian developer, you know. Um, so I said we're pretty feudal, but I think fairly meritocratic. If you step up, if you want to do something and you step up and do it, people will generally support you and if you do a good job, you'll find yourself maintaining that thing, um, whether it's a package or infrastructure or um, a team of people. Every package has its own maintainers, and they are the experts in that package. They're expect uh, you can assume that they'll know what's going on. I think I've already covered that. Um, because individual maintainers of packages doesn't scale that well. I mean, people, everyone in Debian, no one's employed to work in Debian. So people have day jobs and occasionally they vanish for a while because they have a baby or they just got bored of open source and want to get on and have a life for a bit. Um, and this can be a real pain when a core package has its maintainer vanish. So what's been becoming a lot more popular in recent years is to have teams of maintainers of packages. Um, and in the Python world, we have two teams that look after most of the Python-related things in Debian. There's a team for libraries and a team for apps. 
These teams work very well because the rules of the team say that anyone in the team can do whatever they want to any of the packages. It's sort of kind of nice if you talk to the person who actually has some history of maintaining it before you do something, but if you can't get hold of them, it's fine, you just do it. Um, in general, that seems to be the way Debian is going, and I think it's a good thing. You probably know about Debian's legendarily slow release schedule. Um, something like every two years we release and we support releases for about three years. Basically, we support it a year into the next release. Ubuntu does a bit longer than that, but it's fairly similar. Um, and a lot of you use Debian actually use, using Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a supported core of Debian. It's mostly unmodified Debian, just imported into Ubuntu and rebuilt. There are a few new packages. Um, there are very few developers, I would say less than 100 compared to well over 1,000 in Debian. Um, that's referring to everything. In Python, you probably find there's even more, they are even more similar between Debian and Ubuntu because Python is generally a little more portable. Um, a lot of Ubuntu infrastructure is written in Python. Python's kind of Canonical's preferred language. So they sometimes jump a little bit ahead and they produce a lot of upstream Python code that's in Debian and Ubuntu. But I think this is largely applicable to the entire operating system. You'll find that the exceptions to this are things like desktop environments where people change everything. Um, yeah, release cycles very similar, about five years support instead of three and there's a commercial com company behind it. I suppose there are companies behind Debian as well, but it's slightly less obvious. There are also six monthly releases. Um, that is a interestingly different feature, but you know about all of these things. From being involved in the community, the, one of the more interesting things about Ubuntu is that there are people paid to work on the archive, so things can happen really quickly. If you want to transition to a new version of a library and it's gonna affect 100 packages, if it's important enough, a canonical employee will sit down and do it probably in a day or two, where it might take three months in Debian. Um, and of course, they'll submit all those patches to Debian, so Debian can do it as well. Right, that's enough about the operating systems. We're really here to talk about Python and Debian. Um, let's start with the C Python interpreter. So a long time ago, we had one Python package. You installed Python. It was probably one of the very early um, 1.x Pythons. And when we shifted to a new Python, it broke everything and we had to fix everything. There was no time for transitioning sanely. Um, I think since Python 2.0, we've had more than one Python in the archive at the same time. And that allowed us to, have, to bring in a new Python, start getting things working with the new one. When everything's using the new one, we can make it the defaults and make the old one go away. We often have to lose a few packages in the process, but that's fine, because probably no one cares about them if they haven't done anything about fixing them. I'm giving this history in terms of Python versions because I think it's far more understandable than years. I don't know what years these things happened in, but it's, you all remember Python 2.3, right? Um, somewhere around there, we added a package called Python that always the, installs the current default Python, and there's a path, package called Python all, Python hyphen all, that installs all the supported Pythons um, <laughs> The same thing for Python 3, it's a Python 3 package and a Python 3 all package. This sort of separated the notion of defaults out of the interpreter packages themselves. Um, again, if you're a library maintainer, it probably doesn't matter to you too much. So why do we have Python stuff in Debian at all? The main reason is probably applications because people write applications in Python and Debian would like to ship some of those applications because we think our users probably find them useful. Um, so, yeah, we ship applications, people want them. Um, a lot of them can be kept out of the normal import path because many applications have crazy internal APIs and you don't really want to expose them to users of the system. So we can put them, if you know your file system, we can put them in user share application name rather than some way that you can import if you just do an import. Um, applications tend to be fairly straightforward. Libraries tend to be where more, a bit more of the complica complexity is. Obviously, many of these applications depend, um, depend on libraries, and so we need to have some libraries in the archive. We also might need to have libraries in the archive because developers would find them useful. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to build the GNOME Python um, wrappers. They are they're insane. Auto-conf build system. Um, 
you're never going to build anything like that with pip. If, you're going to, if you want to use it, probably the best thing to do is install the Debian package. So some of the, these libraries are also convenient for developers. Um, in many situations, you can't easily use C extensions, but it's far easier to use a Python package in Debian that provides a C extension. So convenience. As I said earlier, we've got, we can only ship one version of any library at, in the archive at the same time, which is in part a good thing because it means there's less code du duplication and that's good for the amount of effort required to do a security update or something like that. Um, and it keeps disk space down and archive size down. It's, it's a fairly good thing all around. But it means that if they've got a very popular library, everything that uses that library has to be updated to use a new version before you switch to that new version, preferably in a backwards compatible way so that the transition can be done without um, having a flag day. Some, some Python library authors seem to understand this and use sane API um, strategies. You only add functions, you don't remove them, you don't make backwards incompatible changes. But obviously it's harder to do that in the early stages of a project and some people just don't seem to be able to do it at all. Um, every now and then you get very responsible authors who when they make a backwards co incompatible change, they completely change the name of their library. So for example, um, Beautiful Soup version four is now called BS4 instead of Beautiful Soup. Um, and Ginger went to Ginger 2. In a very stable library that makes a lot of sense, um, and when you, when you do that, then we, are, then we can have both things in the archive at the same time because the Debian archive, you can have um, each package name can only appear once, but if the package name contains a version, that's fine. Um, so, but if, let's go back to some history again. When people started packaging Python things, they needed to do some fairly common things in every Python package they built. Like you need to byte compile the .py files to .pyc files. Because if you don't do that, when root imports the Python file, Python will build a .pyc file as root. I mean, root can write anywhere in the file system, right? So it'll write a .pyc file in user lib, wherever the, this library is. And then when you uninstall it, suddenly you've got these directories that have a bunch of files and that the package manager doesn't know anything about and these things easier. So someone wrote a tool called Python Central that did common thing. It, did byte compilation when you installed and it removes the, byte, the PYC files when you uninstall. It also handled a few dependency things for you. Um, then a few years later, someone else who didn't like the maintainer of Python Central decided to write his own thing called Python support. Um, and they ended up in a feature war with each other where they ended, they ended up supporting the same feature set. One, one of them would decide to solve a problem or add a feature before the other one, then the other one would copy because that's a good idea, we should do that. Um, but we ended up with these two totally different systems that most of the time it didn't matter, but occasionally it did. If you had things that shared a namespace, they needed to use the same system. And it is a bit of a mess, especially when you're trying to explain this to newbies and they say, well, most of the time you should use that system except when you should use that system. Um, you should use the more popular one, except when you need to talk to the one something that's using the less popular one. Um, Python support, yeah, so one of the things it added was automatic rebyte compilation. So in the very early days, whenever we changed C Python version, we had to change all the Python libraries to byte compile against the new one and upload them all to the archive again. Python support said, you know what, we can do this easily. When you change um, Python version, just notice that that's happened and rebyte compile for everything. Now that was upgrade. Um, and users generally don't like being having the app broken halfway through an upgrade and left in a totally uh, broken system that they've got to put back together themselves. So around the time that these upgrade problems, for upgrade failures are becoming a problem. Um, we also realized we were getting to the end of Python 2 because Python 3 was coming around. We knew 2.7 or 2. Points, at that time we're still in 2.6 was probably going to be one of the last Python 2.Xs and we wouldn't have these problems for much longer. Um, so we could look at making sure that these problems didn't come around again in Python 3 and get rid of this automatic rebyte compilation in Python 2. So in the early days of Python 3, really no one cared. Um, I don't think anyone used Python 3.0. 
apparently it had horrific I.O. performance, but people didn't even notice until a while after release. Um, around early Python 3.1, Canonical started pushing quite heavily to use Python 3 and Ubuntu, which is starting to show payoff now. Um, and the Debian community decided that we wanted to try and help push Python in a way that would fit better with Debian. So there are a bunch of PEPs written that um, made distributions life easier. One of them is PEP 3147, the underscore underscore PyCache directory that you've probably seen if you use a Python 3 to 3.x. I think, I think it came in 3.2? I'm not entirely sure. Um, so with this PyCache directory, we can have .pyc files for multiple versions of Python. If you were in Larry's talk earlier, he covered the fact that PYC files change between different Python versions. This was always a problem with us be because if we build a PYC file with 2.4, it's not going to work with 2.5. We have to build a new one. Um, and when they've got the same file name, it's hard to distinguish between the two. So we ended up with having user lib Python 2.5 site packages and user lib Python 2.6 site packages that were entirely different trees of packages. In fact, they were all symlinked to another directory, which made things extra complicated. Um, with PEP 3147, we could get rid of all of this, and we have a PyCache directory that has your module name dot uh, py33 dot pyc. Okay, not exactly that, but dot cpython dash 33 dot pyc and dot 34 for Python 3.4, etc. Um, so now we can have everything living in one directory and they will, the Python will automatically import the write.pyc file. There's some related peps, this, so dash cpython 33.so or 33dmu usually, um, that tells it that this what will work with this particular version of cpython, that dmu applies to build flags, whether you've got wide bytes and d for debugging, etc. Um, something vaguely related is PEP 348. Python now has a way of defining a standard ABI in a C extension so that you can build it once in one version of Python 3 and it'll work with all the other uh, Python 3s that, because they all implement the same ABI. Of course, this is only a subset of the C Python um, API. I've already spoken about that. And very recently, in the last, finally appeared in the archive a month or two ago, we have a single simple way of doing Python package, or doing Python packaging called PyBuild. Um, I'll go into that a bit more later. It knows how to build packages for all our C Python stacks and PyPy. Um, it makes your life very easy if you're a package maintainer. And there is only one option, hopefully. Um, so some of the groups involved, I mentioned that there are two teams in Debian that kind of look after packaging. Uh, these teams still use subversion, so if you want to get involved, that might scare you a little bit. We're always talking about migrating to Git, but no one actually wants to do the work. Um, partly because they know they'll probably get their head bitten off if they try. Um, but if you want something Python related to happen in Debian, come to this team. There are people who know what's going on, and they'll happily sponsor your work. Um, if you want to help, that's the URL for the uh, team joining page, but come and say hi to us in IRC. Um, we always need people to fix bugs. And yeah, if um, there's other people who don't have upload rights that could use some help in reviewing things. And while I'm talking about ways you can help us, something that doesn't happen enough in Debian is people building infrastructure for um, problems. We've got a lot of people working on maintaining packages and the archive, but not on building the infrastructure that helps us do this. And there's a lot of scope for people to build web interfaces and um, general systems in general to make people's lives easier. Um, so how many people here maintain Python libraries that are in Debian? Does anyone? Woohoo, a couple of people. <laughs> So I'll speak a bit, little bit about what might be interesting to you. Um, say, if it's not maintained by you in Debian, um, create a relationship with your Debian package maintainer. Talk to them. Probably join the team that they're in. Um, it's 
often use. Sometimes they go away a bit and you need to do things without them. And you can very easily subscribe to the bugs for your package in Debian and in Ubuntu. Um, I can show you how to do that. It's trivial. You get them an email. Um, be nice, make stable, write stable APIs, and have generally have patience. Um, the most common reason I speak to people about things on Debian is because they, say, they come up to me and say, I use Debian and there's this package that is five years out of date. Uh, and I've tried emailing the guy who maintains it and nothing happens. What can we do about it? There's a lot you can do. Um, if it's in a team, obviously you can just join the team or find someone on the team to help you out. Um, you can email the maintainer yourself and offer, offer to help. Often people are busy. You know what the open source world is like. Often just saying, can I help you? I've got this bug that needs to be fixed. Here's a patch. That normally gets you a response. Um, otherwise, we have procedures for taking over package, packages uh, against maintainers' will. Well, not against their will. If they've, if the normal thing is that they've vanished. They just go into a black hole. Um, and we can request packages be removed. Sometimes, if it's not being maintained, it's better for everyone if we just get rid of it, um, rather than wasting people's time on it. So let's talk about what you're probably here for, which is how do we do Debian packaging in the modern world? Um, how do you package Python modules for your system, and how would you package applications? Debian, Python, Debian packaging in general has a reputation of being incredibly arcane and complicated, but it's built on ve a few very simple principles, and if you understand the idea of what it's trying to do, I think things tend to make sense. So I'm going to explain a bit about the background. We have a concept of a source package, which is a collection of an upstream source, essentially a tarball of their most recent release, or they get repository if they don't do releases, which seems to be becoming popular. Sometimes we need some patches on top of it because they did something really stupid, or they did something that we need to change to make it integrate a bit better with Debian. Um, and sometimes those patches are just bug fixes because the last release was a year ago and there was a really major bug that they fixed since then. Beyond that, we've got a Debian directory in the source package and most of what it contains is RFC 822-ish text files. So um, things that look like... Uh, gee, is that way too big for you? So it's something like um, key, value, new line. Really simple. Something can wrap over multiple lines if it has to. Um, let's zoom that out a bit. It might be more legible. I, yeah, you can, I mean, you can intuitively see how this works. You don't know what everything means, but you can edit it fairly straightforwardly. Um, oh, that crashed. Nice. Let's get back to where we were. There somewhere, I guess. There that aren't RFC 822-ish, there's the rules file, which is a make file. Now, I know people don't know how to write make files anymore these days because they don't like writing C. Um, <laughs> but make files are actually quite a good way of describing how to build something. Once you, It's basically a shell script with a bit of dependency management thrown in. Um, and we've got the change log, which is an entirely special file that I could, I'll discuss in a bit. Um, we take this source package and we run it through our build system and produce a binary package. Um, you can do this very easily on your own machine by typing dbuild if you've installed the right bits. Um, sometimes it spits out more than one binary package, sometimes just one. For example, if you've got a library that supports Python 2 and Python 3 and PyPy, you can spit out three binary packages, one for Python 2.x, one for Python 3, and one for PyPy. They're all packaged in in the Debian system, they're all in different subtrees of um, slash users, so, so they all need to be on their own packages. Um, historically, this used to be very complicated. You would have your Debian rules file would be <coughs> four or five screen fills long, and it would look exactly the same as everyone else's except for the bits that you changed. And you know how this works. When you copy and paste large chunks of code from other people, then you miss out on bug fixes, and you 
copy the same bugs that they had. Um, and it, it thinks it knows how to build everything. And when it does the wrong thing, you can override it and say, actually, no, instead of doing that, I need you to do this at this point. Um, Python version, how to run the tests once for each Python version, and how to stick those all in binary packages. That's basically all you're doing when you're building a package. So it's a full so let me show you some example packages. There's some source. You recognize this. There's a setup.py. There's, that's probably the library there. Yeah, rather ugly looking thing, hey? <laughs> so we've got a change log, which is just like any other change log you've ever written, except it's formatted in a particular format. That's, we've, we've got a tool that does this. You don't need to worry about it. But you know, there's an entry for each version of the package and the version of the package gets determined by the topmost entry. A compat file with one character in it, very useful. Um, and the, the, the control file, the first block in this specifies the source package. This thing itself is a source package, it's just some information about it, who maintains it, what it's going to need to build it, um, where, where you can find it on the internet. There's one for PyPy, and there's one for Python 3. Um, it's a copyright file. We a bit, um, what's the word I should use here? Pedantic. We, pedantic, yes, that'll be good. We don't really want to break the law, so we do a pretty good copyright review of everything in the archive. I'm sure you've heard Debian cares about copyright and licensing a lot more than most people do. That's actually a freeform text file. You can say whatever you want. Um, and then the few files to say in, I mean that, let me go back. That one said, in the Python 3 package, you should, oh, this is no. In the PyPy package, you should install all the stuff that's in user lib PyPy. Uh, blah, you don't, those are details. But the main point is that the make file is now three lines long and it says, use dh, build for Python 2, Python 3, PyPy, and use the new PyBuild system. And doing that is enough that it should just work. Let me try and build it. DH just does all the things. And at some point here it'll be done, it'll spit out some binary. There we go, it's a bit spit out some devs. Um, let's have a look at those. We got a Python 2, see Python dash app, um, module name tells us it's a Python 2 library. It depends on Python. Um, and it contains, remember I said we got a thing where we symlink libraries between different versions and we symlink them into user lib Python 2.7. User lib 2. Python 2.7 is what's actually on the Python path. The PyShare directory is just for convenience. Uh, there you can see all the some links. Um, yeah, boring. PyPy one and the Python three one don't need all those some links because uh, in PyPy I added pip three one four seven support, and in Python three it's upstream. Um, right, that's that one. Let's look at something a little bit more complicated. So that's legible, yeah. Um, no, it's not used. Syntax highlighting is wrong for this background. Very similar. This one's got a lot more. Where are we? And in the rules file, we've overridden how it does tests and said actually when you want to test, please use PyTest with these arguments um, and run it once, once for each interpreter. So once for Python 2.7, once for Python 3.2, you know, whatever the current supported Python interpreters are. Um, and we're building some debug packages because when we build C libraries, it's often useful to add debugging symbols and versions for the, um, we've got 
two, two builds of each C Python interpreter in the archive. We've got a normal build and we've got a build with a debug flag enabled. So it does extra um, debugging of memory allocation, I think. Um, but it needs, it's got a different CABI, so we need to rebuild the modules for it, and there's also going these debug packages. Um, that's about all I had to demo. I would love questions. I'm afraid this is probably all quite deep, uh, but. Don't want, don't want to say, just look at what other people do and copy them. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, yeah, often, often in Debian, our documentation lags behind the code. Um, for PyBuild, we've got a man page that's, often the documentation's in man pages. Um, this tells you how to use PyBuild, but it doesn't tell you anything about how you hook it up with DH. If you've got a particular problem, come and ask on IRC. Some, Someone, someone will help. The hash Debian mentors channel on um, irc.debian.org and hash Ubuntu packaging on irc.freenode.org, both of which have, you might have to wait a few hours to get a reply, but sometimes you get a reply straight away. Yeah, MJ. No, you probably wouldn't. If you're a real Python developer, you probably wouldn't care about distributions at all because you you live in the world of working on the current uh, head of Python or whatever. Um, um, yeah, so I, t I tend to package libraries if I want to install them system-wide on my system, but sometimes they're quite hairy to package. Often the reason that I'm having to package it in the first place is because it's a library no one's heard of and the maintainer didn't do a particularly good job of it. So some, sometimes, yes, but if you're doing it for yourself, you might as well share it with other people as well. Get, get it into the archive. Yeah. So we have pip in the archive, which means that we do expect that you'll probably use it. Um, I wouldn't recommend anyone use sudo pip install because it's going to put stuff in user local that you'll never be able to clean up again. Um, I would suggest you use virtual imps and use pip inside them. Um, so what we've, something I didn't mention at all is use a lib. Uh, if you've used a C Python on Debian, you probably noticed that we don't have a site packages directory, which you would expect us to have. Instead, we've got this thing called dist packages. Um, and the reason we did that is so that if you want to build your own C Python from source, you can build it. You can build your own C Python 2.7 and use a local, and it will use different modules to the ones that would be used with the your own problem in user local, and you do whatever you want. If you use easy install or pip with um, Debian's Python, it will go and use a local dist packages, and yeah, again, it's your, your it's your system. You can do what you want, but I wouldn't recommend you do that. I say use a virtual env. We try to have reasonably current virtual end and Debian. Most of the same. Anyone else?